Today on Blue 58, the Packers benefited from an unlikely win last weekend as the Jets took down the Rams, but a lot of Jets fans were unhappy about it, and it's easy to understand why. So how do we fix somebody being upset about their team winning? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. Big Full episode today, got a lot of topics that I want to get to, but first we've got to start off with an a update about our charity drive. Things continue apace in that drive, and so much credit goes out to you, the listeners and supporters of Blue 58 and the Power Sweep. So far, we have raised, as of 8.03 p.m. on December 22nd, 2020, $871. We are well over the threshold That would trigger our jersey giveaway, so that's not even going to be a problem. And on top of that, we have vastly surpassed any expectations I had for this effort. I really didn't know what to expect. It sure wasn't being within spitting distance of $1,000. I wish I had more prizes to give out. As it stands, you've got about a 1 in 20 shot of winning a jersey of the player of your choice, up to $125. Um, And your odds are improved because one of the people who has donated has dropped out, just wants to put in a donation. That would be my mother-in-law, who we'll talk more about here in a second. So if you want to get in on the jersey giveaway, you still have a pretty good shot. Any donation amount gets you in there. Just send proof to the Power Sweep somehow, preferably email the Power Sweep 1959 at gmail.com. Get in touch there. Prove to us that you have donated. The instructions are in this in the post at thepowersweep.com. We'll put out a link with uh, with this podcast. I wanted to share a little bit more about why we chose the charity that we did. I mentioned when we were describing the charities we were doing that I have some personal connections with this particular cause, not the Adrian Amos I'm Still Here Foundation in particular, but Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's awareness in general. My dad's grandmother, um, my dad's mom's mom, died of this disease. But I, she was healthy enough that I can remember visiting her when I was very, very little, three or four years old. And I remember not understanding at the time why she didn't understand that we were there to visit her. And I thought that was just terribly sad that she didn't understand why my dad was there to see her. I didn't understand why she wasn't like my grandma. This is my dad's grandma. Why is she not like my grandma? That made me very sad, even as a a very, very young child. My wife's grandmother, my mother-in-law's mother, passed away from a after a long struggle with Alzheimer's and dementia about six months before we met. And it makes me very sad to hear about that, to, to think about that, because um, I never got to know this person who was very instrumental in my wife's life. My wife is a musician, and part of her love for music started with her grandma. Her grandma was also a tremendous sports fan, and I know she would have had thoughts about this podcast. She was a big fan of the Detroit Tigers, a big fan of professional wrestling. Do that math for a second. So she was in her 80s when she died, a lifelong professional wrestling fan. She got in early on professional wrestling. Encyclopedic memory about baseball. Love taking my mother-in-law to games when she was little. And we were robbed of that person by this disease. So I think anything that we can do to combat that and to help people whose families are affected by it means a lot to me personally. And I understand in this particular year, if donating is tough, I get that. And I'm not, don't want to pressure you to participate. But I just wanted to let you know why we are picking, we have picked that particular cause. On a sadly not more uplifting note, we got to start the podcast with some unfortunate news. Former Packers outside linebackers coach Kevin Green has passed away at the age of 58. I don't have to tell you about 
Kevin Green. He's a great player in his day, a prototypical 3-4 outside linebacker. Had he come into the league today with the same skill set that he did back when he first started in the 80s, I think he still would have been a successful player. You know him from the it is time moment from the Super Bowl. Here's some stuff that you might not have known about him. He also had a criminal justice degree from Auburn and was a member of the National Guard, actually a captain in the National Guard. I came across this story from Twitter user at Waiting for Rona. Uh, he wrote this in a, in a very high, heartwarming thread about Kevin Green. Kevin's brother was a captain in the U.S. Army and a troop commander in my cavalry squadron when we deployed to Desert Storm. When we returned stateside in April of 91, we were ushered from our airplane single file into an adjacent hangar to gather for orders, etc. As we shuffled in, the line kept stopping and those of us in the back grumbled loudly because we were anxious to see our families waiting inside the hangar. As I made my way into the hangar door, I saw why the line was moving so slowly. There standing at the end was Kevin Green. He could have grabbed his brother and headed off somewhere to talk, but that wasn't why I was there. He stood at the head of the line, greeted each of us, shook our hand, and said, Welcome home. Amidst all the celebration and cheers that surrounded our homecoming, the fact that Kevin took time to welcome each one of us home still stands out in my mind. A few years ago, I saw Kevin coaching on the sidelines during a Packers game, so I sent him a letter via the Packers and told him how much what he did still means to me today. He sent me back a letter with signed, a signed player's card and said that he was happy that he was able to leave me with such a fond memory. Just a little insight into the kind of person Kevin Green was. What jumps out to me, though, from all the Kevin Green remembrances is this clip from NFL Films. So Kevin Green played his career largely under Dom Capers, first in Pittsburgh and then in Carolina, and then he got his first coaching job under Dom Capers in Green Bay. In a famous play that they had uh, in Pittsburgh was Dog Rush 1. It put Kevin Green in a position basically to be a one-on-one uh, edge rusher, and he was very successful with it. The NFL film's remembrance of Kevin Green concludes with a clip of him talking to Dom Capers prior to a Packers game. Just listen to this for a second. I think probably being away from him for 10 years makes you appreciate it that much more, too. I tell you what, I'm having the time of my life right now. I know that. Yeah, so, this is awesome. We're going to get after it today. Dog rush one, Coach Dom. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm reading too much into that clip by saying that it reveals a lot about the relationship between Kevin Green and Dom Capers. If you've played sports, you understand how hard it is to not continue to call coaches you really love and respect coach after they've stopped being your coach anymore. About 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to coach basketball at my former high school and my high school basketball coach was still there it was really hard to approach him as a peer with ideas and thoughts and like maybe we should do this maybe we should think about this or maybe we should do this this way even though we nominally were now he I was an assistant coach he was a head coach but we were at much different positions on the org chart than we were when I was playing it's interesting to hear just a little bit of that in Kevin Green's voice. Dom Capers presented him when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Just getting a little glimpse into that relationship, I think, is very cool. Kevin Green looked like a maniac when he was playing football, because he was one. But there was a lot more to him than that. And I think that's always a good thing to remember about any football player. Interesting moves actually happening in Green Bay on the football field today. Got news that Corey Lindsley practiced today. This is huge news, great news. He's been designated to return from injured reserve. I doubt he's back on the field this week, but he looks by every indication to be well on his way to playing for the Packers in the playoffs. Something we've heard from Matt LaFleur a lot this year is getting the best five offensive linemen out there. Well, the best five for the Packers is a lot better with him out there. And it unlocks the option of having Billy Turner at one guard spot and Elton Jenkins at the other. 
Now, I know there are still some mixed feelings about Billy Turner out there, but I think given how Lucas Patrick has played the last couple of weeks, having Jenkins and Turner at your tack or at your guards and Rick Wagner at right tackle is a better option than having Elton Jenkins at center, Lucas Patrick at guard, and then the other guards on the right side. That's, I think, a, a much preferable situation for the Packers in the playoffs. Jamal Williams, however, is not practicing today. It doesn't seem to be a big concern. However, I do wonder if this opens the door potentially for uh, Patrick Taylor to return or to get a crack at getting to the active roster. Now, I've been interested in him as a potential candidate since the draft. He met a lot of the uh, height, weight, speed requirements um, that we like to look for for a running back, six foot two, 217 pounds. Was injured his final season in college at Memphis. It's possible that he could be making his way back uh, to full strength here in the very near future. And given that the Packers uh, don't have a lot of other options out there at running back, Dexter Williams is on the practice squad. I'd be interested to see uh, if he gets an option or if he gets a gets a, a look here in the relatively near future if Jamal Williams can't go. Dexter Williams is probably the first choice. Mike Weber is also kicking around on the practice squad, but I just want to throw the name Patrick Taylor your way as something to remember. Finally, the Packers signed J.J. Molson, a kicker, a rookie out of UCLA, is what the press release said. Uh, Spent some time with the Los Angeles Chargers earlier this month. The Montreal, Canada native was selected by the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the seventh round of the 2020 Canadian Football League draft in May. In four college seasons, Molson connected on 51 of 74 field goals with a long of 50 yards while registering 145 touchbacks on 266 kickoffs. He's going to wear number nine for the Packers. I don't want to read any imminent concern about Mason Crosby in here. The move here is pretty obvious, I think. The Packers are getting ready for the playoffs. And if anything should happen to Mason Crosby, or even if he would just go on the COVID-19 reserve list again, the Packers want a an in-house replacement who's familiar with the rest of the kicking battery. So they want him to be familiar with how uh, J.K. Scott operates. They want him to be familiar with how Hunter Bradley operates. That way, if they have to make a change at kicker, they've got somebody right there ready to go. And they don't have to have anybody clear uh, COVID protocols or anything like that. We also got news this week that the Packers are sending seven players to the Pro Bowl. Got a bunch of guys in there. Let's have some reactions quick to each of those seven guys. Devontae Adams uh, leads the way alphabetically. It's good to see him getting the nod. Uh, It's finally good to see Devontae Adams getting getting two things this year. First, counting stats. Uh, One of the knocks that we saw on Devontae Adams for a long time was that he didn't put up up big numbers. Uh, That was because he had his really – his first season as the undisputed number one receiver with Brett Hundley as his primary – uh, passer. Then the 2018 season was just a rough one for everyone. He was hurt a little bit in there. 2019, he was also hurt a little bit. But this year, even though he's been hurt, he's putting up monster numbers and he's getting some external recognition for that. For a long time, he has been your favorite wide receiver's favorite wide receiver. Now people are seeing some of his numbers alongside with that and getting some league wide recognition as well. Second one this year is Jair Alexander. This one is also good to see. Uh, He's another guy who struggles a little bit with those counting stats, doesn't get a lot of interceptions, but boy, does he lock down his side of the field. He's having a great year in that respect, and it's good to see him get some validation there too. Don't have a lot to say about David Bakhtiari. He's, for my money, the best tackle in the game. Of course, he should be going to the Pro Bowl. Though it was funny for a while, though that joke is now over. It was funny uh, when he would make the Pro Bowl, or not make the Pro Bowl, excuse me, and then get voted all pro. That was kind of just hilarious. Now he's too famous for that. And, uh, oh, well, I'd rather have that for him than, uh, than not getting recognized. So that good. Uh, Elton Jenkins of the seven is really the most interesting to me. Making the Pro Bowl in his second year is a sneaky, huge deal for Elton Jenkins. Jenkins is a second round pick, which means that his contract is four years long. So he's got two years after this season left. Chances are really good that he's going to make a Pro Bowl again within the next two years, regardless of how he plays. And there's really no reason to think he's not going to play well, but he's going to make a Pro Bowl again within the next two years just because people know who he is now. So he's going to be able to 
very likely negotiate his second contract with the Packers or whoever else, heaven forbid, as a multi-time Pro Bowler. That is a good position for him to be in. And despite what it would mean for the Packers, if we're rooting for the best for these guys, that's something that we want for them. Same goes for Aaron Jones. He is making his first Pro Bowl in his second consecutive really good year. Don't want to touch on the debate about where he's going to end up, Packers, not the Packers, whatever. I think we've said more than enough about that. For right now, just really good news for him. And whether he ends up with the Packers or somebody else, having a Pro Bowl on your resume is a, is a big deal. Final two, Aaron Rodgers and Zedaria Smith. What else are you going to say? Of course, they deserve to go to the Pro Bowl. Somebody who did deserve to go to the Pro Bowl but did not end up going was Robert Tunyon. Robert Tunyon, excuse me. Maybe he didn't get in because people like me continue to mispronounce his name. Robert Tunyon was snubbed. There's really no reason that a guy who has 10 receiving touchdowns more than anybody else at his position should not be going to the Pro Bowl. And yet Evan Ingram is with the New York Giants and Robert Tunyon is not. First and foremost, I would ask you to free yourself of the burden of caring about the Pro Bowl. I know we did just cover it a little bit. This should be the smallest of potatoes because, first, it doesn't matter. Hopefully the Packers won't even have the option to have anyone being involved with the Pro Bowl at all because they'll have other things going on around that time, if you know what I mean. Secondly, as soon as you accept that it's a popularity contest and not a reflection of actual football talent, the happier you will be. It's a lot easier to get over the idea of Robert Tanya not making the Pro Bowl if you just understand that it has very little to do with who he is as a player and everything to do with how many people know who he is. Evan Ingram has been with the New York Giants now for several years. A lot of people know who he is for reasons that should be obvious. Those are bad reasons to vote him for the Pro Bowl, but that's how the Pro Bowl works, okay? It's the same reason that people argue, or it's the same sort of reason, wrong reason, why people get bent out of shape over guys either getting into the Pro or the Hall of Fame with bad stats or thinking they deserve to be in because of stats. It's the Hall of Fame, not the Hall of Stats. It's the Pro Bowl of Fame, not the Pro Bowl of Stats. I know I did just say that Robert Tunyon should get in because his stats are good, and I think that's true, but that's not why people get into the Pro Bowl. Sometimes it is. Generally, it's not. People know who Evan Ingram is. Evan Ingram is. People don't know yet who Robert Tunyon is until he goes off for 200 yards in the playoffs and the Packers win a game because he scored eight touchdowns or something like that. Let's hope that happens. That'd be really cool. Of note, via capologist Ken Ingalls on Twitter, Devontae Adams, David Bakhtiari, and Zadarius Smith will all have their base salaries go up by a million dollars combined next year uh, because they all had Pro Bowl escalators in their contract. That's really all this matters about, or matters for, if guys have Pro Bowl escalators in their contracts. Get a little bit of extra money, all three of them deserve it. Final thing you should know about heading into this weekend that is more procedural than anything is playoff scenarios. Packers can clinch their first round by this weekend with one of two things happening. First, a combination of a Packers win and a Seattle loss or tie, or the Packers tying with the Tennessee Titans, the New Orleans Saints losing or tying, Seattle losing or tying, as long as both New Orleans and Seattle don't both tie. Clear as mud? Good. Packers just got to win. Let everything else sort itself out. As we wind down the season here, the question of tanking is on a lot of people's minds. It was on a lot of Jets fans' minds as they beat the Los Angeles Rams over the weekend and presumably took themselves out of the running for the top pick in the NFL draft, or at least made it much more difficult for them to get the top pick. And the prize of Trevor Lawrence or Justin Fields or whatever quarterback you prefer that goes with it. That prompted listener Angus to write in from overseas, I might add, this wonderful question. Quote, in light of the Jets' excellent win last night, I've been thinking about the much-discussed phenomenon of tanking. 
I am feeling that this is an excellent example of why the NFL might wish to consider a different way of giving out those high-value top-of-the-draft picks. The Jets proved last night that any team has the skill to beat any other, and whilst they had the professionalism to beat L.A. as opposed to attempting to secure draft capital, I wonder whether we can be so sure that other coaches slash hierarchies can be relied upon to act with as much integrity. As a Packer fan, I am very happy that they took the game from the Rams, but in other circumstances, I can see myself being inf- irritated that the Rams had been given a game by a tanking team, which is basically a function of scheduling and luck. I was thinking it might be interesting to collect the teams who qualify for the first four picks and then assign randomly. This may dissuade teams from not giving their all, if indeed that happens at all. Then he goes on to ask what our thoughts might be about solutions to the problem of tanking. I have a lot of thoughts about this. I've actually thought about this quite a bit, and I think there are some interesting potential solutions here. But first and foremost, Angus, I want to say I'm very jealous of your name. I have always wanted a cool nickname, and having a straight-up cool name is way cooler than having a cool nickname. All I get as John is misspellings. All I get as John Meerdink is misspellings, mispronunciations, whatever, of both first and last names. John has obvious issues. J-O-N is how I spell my name because it's short for Jonathan. But I get J-O-H-N all the time, even in emails, even when people are replying to emails. It's J-O-N. It's right there in the email. But then the last name, people can't seem to get that right either. It looks or it sounds just how it looks. But I say it, I say Meerdink. People say Neerdink. I say no. They say Beernink. I say no. They say mere sink. I say that's a typo. Still no. They say mentink, a very common name where I'm from. Still not correct. They say mere donk. And no. Why? How did you get that? It's mere dink. Not as cool as Angus. And Angus is from uh, the UK. So it's probably even cooler pronunciation wise. All I get is John. Anyway. I don't really think tanking happens the way a lot of people think it does for a couple of reasons. First, bad teams are often just that bad. The Miami Dolphins got accused of tanking last year. What they were really doing, I think, is cleaning a lot of bad contracts off their books and trying to instill a foundation of young players that they could build with long term. Brian Flores is trying to instill a culture there, last year at least, and uh they were not going to wait around with these higher-priced veterans who weren't going to be there long-term anyway, so they just cleared them all out at once, got the draft capital they could, and just wrote it out for a year. I don't think that's tanking so much as just being honest about where you are. That's taking your medicine with the rebuild that you're doing. So they were really just that bad because they didn't have any players. Second, if you're going to do the opposite thing, keep the players that you want around, but then try to lose semi on purpose, you need a lot more buy-in. A lot of this is about culture. And if your culture stinks, and if your culture is just like, we're going to be okay with losing, chances are whoever you get when you tank is probably not going to help you all that much anyway. But you also need buy-in from guys who are potentially hurting themselves in a job where you have a very short window to make money. You're asking them to say, look, I need you to not get the best stats that you can. I need you to not play as hard as you could because what we really need to do is lose these games so that we can be better long-term when you're maybe not here. Sound good to you? I think that's that's probably just too high a hurdle to overcome. But let's say that tanking is a thing that happens. Is this something that we should fix? Generally, I think I'm fine with the way the system goes right now. If you change the way the draft order is determined, I suspect you would just get a different kind of tanking. So let's go with Angus's idea here, which I think is probably what would be the first step if they wanted to change something about the draft. They'd probably do it incrementally and just say, maybe the top four is going to be different. So say we did that. I think all you're doing in that situation is going from people tanking to get the very top spot in the draft to tanking to have a shot at getting the top stop spot in the draft. So instead of having two or three teams really jockeying for that top one to two slots, suddenly you've probably got six or seven teams 
jockeying to get into the top four, thinking maybe we might have a shot of getting that top four. Right now it's restricted to the very, very top of the draft, if it exists at all. But if you expand it, I think it just moves it down a little bit. But let's say you did something a little bit different. Here are some options. Say you wanted to fix the top end of the draft to get around tanking. How would you do that? I've got three options for you. I think something like a lottery is probably the most likely solution. It's kind of interesting how the NBA does it. You've got um, the made-for-TV event of the draft lottery itself. You've got the intrigue down the stretch of when are these teams going to decide to be sellers and get rid of their players that they they think are good so that they have an increased chance of losing more games to um, maybe get into the lottery. So I think the first and most obvious solution is that you just do a lottery, but you do it for the bottom eight teams, the bottom quarter of the league. You weight it by record and then sort it out from there. This does expand the window potentially for tanking like we talked about earlier, but I don't think it does it a whole lot because there's still going to be teams in that say like eight to 12 range who will be in the thick of it for the playoffs until right at the very end. And I think you really are going to have a hard time given some of the things that come along with going into the playoffs, um, playoff money, for instance, for, for players, you're going to have a hard time Say you're like at seven and seven with two games left, alive for the playoffs. You're going to say, have a hard time saying, hey, let's tank, try to get as low as we can, and maybe something will work out where we can get into the lottery. A second idea would be to do a lottery type draft order for all of the non playoff teams. So, with the playoff expansion, we now have 14 playoff teams. But that means, if my math is correct, we have 18 non-playoff teams. And expanding it that way gets interesting because there's a chance you could have a team from a good division miss the playoffs with, say, 10 wins and still end up with a really high draft pick, potentially the first overall draft pick. I think that's actually a really good thing because one of the big criticisms of where uh, the way the NFL playoffs are set up right now is that it's possible to have a team from a really bad division like the NFC East get in as a division winner and a team with a better record from a better division end up at home. That's not ideal because you want the best teams playing in the playoffs. But if you give, I guess, kind of a consolation prize to these teams that are still in the playoff hunt but don't make it, that does balance that out a little bit. Secondly, the benefit of being first overall is that you get your choice of quarterbacks, really. The real upside to being that high is that you get your pick of the litter at the most important position. But if you just miss the playoffs, you probably have a quarterback already. So let's look, for example, at the playoff standings right now. Let's pick a division, say, what's a good division here? The NFC North, or the AFC North. This is actually a really good example. So Baltimore is 9-5 and five right now. If the playoffs started tomorrow, it looks like they would be on the outside looking in. It'd be between them and probably Tennessee, from the looks of it, for the very final spot in the playoffs. And Tennessee is ahead of them right now. So if Baltimore were to miss the playoffs but end up with a very high draft pick, do you think it's very likely that they would take a quarterback? I say probably not, given that they have former league MVP Lamar Jackson on the roster. But even though they didn't make the playoffs, they still get an opportunity to get a really high draft pick, and they might be able to get something else. That's good for the Ravens, but also good for the other bad teams. Because even though they didn't get the top spot, The other quarterbacks now are going to get pushed down the draft order, and that changes things for everybody, and that makes things more interesting. I think this is a win, and I think it's an interesting possibility. This final one, the third and final one, is the 
absolute craziest thing I've ever seen proposed related to a major sports league as a serious thing. Have you heard about the wheel? This was a real NBA proposal a while back, and it's completely wild, and I love it. Grantland, remember grantland.com? Did a big thing about it. They got an exclusive on this. Zach Lowe, then of Grantland, now with ESPN, found out about this proposal called The Wheel. Here is the description of The Wheel from his article in 2013. Quote, the proposal, which would eliminate the draft lottery and replace it with a system, the proposal would eliminate, excuse me, the draft lottery and replace it with a system in which each of the 30 teams would pick in a specific first-round slot once, and exactly once, every 30 years. Each team would simply cycle through the 30 draft slots year by year in a predetermined order designed so that teams pick in different areas of the draft each year. Teams would know with 100% certainty which slots they would pick every year, up to 30 years out from the start of every 30-year cycle. End quote. So theoretically... You could have the first overall pick one year, the 15th overall pick the next year, the 24th overall pick the year after that, the 6th overall pick the year after that. But you would know this because the draft order would be determined every year for the next 30 years because you would just rotate through every draft slot. You determine the order randomly at the start, or you have teams bid on where they start out in the wheel. So it's possible that, say, like a really bad team this year, pick whatever team you're thinking of, could be could bid to be the first team to get the first overall pick in the wheel. But that means that they wouldn't pick first overall again for 32 years in the NFL. I absolutely love this idea because it makes things more chaotic and completely divorces the draft from performance. I think this would get absolutely insane when it comes to things like trades. Because say a team like the Kansas City Chiefs, who won the Super Bowl last year, ended up with the first overall pick. They have a great run, and they know that the number one spot on the wheel is coming up next year. They can do a lot of different things there. They're not going to take a quarterback first because they've got Patrick Mahomes, who's great. They could trade that spot. They could take somebody else, maybe an elite edge rusher, maybe something like that. You have real possibilities for dynasties here. They could trade down. They could rack up all kinds of draft capital. Plus, there is absolutely no room for tanking here. You cannot tank to get better draft position because your draft position isn't connected to your performance at all. There is absolutely no chance that the NFL would ever do something like this because the draft is too TV heavy. The draft is too tied into this maybe false idea of hope. It just wouldn't happen in the NFL, but I want it so badly just for the chaos that it would cause. I've started to tell people that chaos is my second favorite NFL team. After the Packers, I just want the weird stuff to happen. This would guarantee extreme weirdness every year. And I think that is incredibly intriguing. So I've got for you in this episode. Do appreciate you listening in. If you think this episode was interesting and would be worth passing on to somebody else, do me a favor and share it. If you would, that's going to help more people find the show and help ultimately to continue to grow this conversation we're having around the Packers and help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.